Hello and welcome to Journey Talks. Temporary name. Uh, just a second, I'm going to finish setting up and we will get started. Okay. Alrighty, so it is Thursday. Uh, sometime in the beginning of December. My name is Seagal Becker Saban, and I am broadcasting uh, to you today from the outskirts of Houston, Texas. Uh, let me take a moment and share with you uh, my gratitude for having this technology that's allowing me uh, to connect with you wherever you are. Are you in the car? Are you washing dishes? Are you on your way to pick up the kids from school? Are you on your walk or your run? I'd love for you to write me. Uh, where are you watching from? What are you doing? Uh, you know, technology is often uh, frowned upon as being a disconnector of people, and justifiably so in many cases, uh, but in our case, it is bringing me into your living room, into your kitchen, to your car, into your gym if you're working out, uh, so I am thankful. So these days, I am uh, on a journey to share the eight journeys of a mama's life um, with you in greater depth um, and finally get these journeys out of my mind and my heart and into digital pixels that will hopefully reach your mama mind and mama heart and inspire you to begin your own journey. So on Tuesday this week, I share the self-care journey and how you can design uh, your own self-care journey for yourself in 2020. Uh, yesterday, I shared the nutrition and the cooking journey. You can look it up on the Journeys from Alex page. And I shared how you can design your own nutrition and cooking journey for yourself in 2020 and follow through with it uh, to completion with an accountability partner. So why am I sharing all this info about journeys with you daily? Why? Why am I taking, um, taking up important mama time of your day that I know is hard to spare in order to discuss the journeys I've done? Uh, because these journeys saved me. Many years ago, when I was in my own uh, dark place inside myself, where mamas go when they do not nourish their bodies and their souls, I had to find a solution to getting back control of my life. Uh, I was very ill with vertigo, and my life was falling apart. After months and months of doctor's appointments, uh, and reading book after book in order to figure out how to heal. Um, I finally took a pen and paper and I decided to organize my life on paper first. Literally, I needed to roadmap my mama life from scratch. Where to start? Well, what are the elements of a mama's life? So I opened a new page in the notebook, just like this one. I open a new page and I began to write. I wrote parenting and then I turned the page and I wrote marriage. And then I turned the page and I wrote child education. And then on and on, I wrote business and family finance home organization, nutrition and cooking, and fitness and self-care. I'm going to turn on the AC, off the AC so you can hear me better. Okay, where were we? So now I had eight pages, um, each with its own title, that describes an element in my mama life that I needed to kind of look at and organize and figure out what to do with. Now what? Well, now I had to fill the page with a roadmap or some sort of plan step by step 
just like you would organize a big cupboard and give your attention to a different drawer each time. I needed to organize uh, the cupboard of my mama life, so to speak. So I started filling page after page with thoughts and ideas and plans uh, for how to improve each element of my life. And after brainstorming on each page, I needed to tie things together um, into a step-by-step -step plan or a roadmap or a journey. And this is how my journeys were born. So if you want to get somewhere, you need a roadmap and you need a destination. That's the basics of traveling or transforming from one place to another, uh, whether it's physically or spiritually. Uh, if my life is a mess and I have no roadmap with goals, how in the world will I ever reach any destination? So granted, I could hire a coach who can help me with each of these categories. Back then, I could have hired a fitness coach to help me with fitness. I could have hired a nutrition coach to help me with nutrition. I could have hired a parenting coach to help me with my parenting. I could have hired a marriage coach to help me with my marriage and on and on. But honestly, this was not within our means. So it finally hit me. I am my own coach and I need to coach me out of this mess that I have created unintentionally. Because no one teaches you how to create an amazing and empowering mama life. Most of us are just winging it, right? So we either replicate what we saw our own moms do or we rebel against it completely. And then we choose the opposite approach of what our moms did. But there are so many options for creating a magical mama life and I'm here to share those with you. Because if I could help one mom, maybe it's you, and I'll show her the magic of the journeys of her life, her own life, in her own home. Yes, yes, between the pile of laundry waiting to be folded and the pile of dishes waiting to be washed and the baby whose diaper needs to be changed somewhere in between, oh, forgive the fly, <laughs> In between all those and within all those lies magic. And that's what we're here to discuss and bring about. So we're here to invite this magic into your life today. Okay, so today I'm going to be diving deeper into the third journey, parenting journey. Are you ready for this? Roll up your sleeves. This is going to be interesting. So as a young mother of three children, and then four children, and then five children, um, I was seeking solutions. I was tired, I was overwhelmed, and I was drowning, and generally not doing a good job raising my kids. Uh, I mean, I felt something was seriously lacking. And I began to do some research until I bumped into a few books that changed my parenting forever. In the books, I read about a concept called attachment between parent and child and how when you do not have attachment, parenting a child can be extremely difficult. Um, and, we, uh, and without attachment, parenting a child uh, it becomes difficult to get along with the child. Um, so I started looking deeper and asking myself, are my kids firmly attached to me? So my instinctual answer was, but of course, yes. <laughs> because frankly, don't we all want to believe that our kids are firmly attached to us? Yeah. Yes, we do. 
Um, as I read the book, Hold On To Your Kids, uh, Hold On To Your Child by um, uh, Dr. Gordon Newfeld and watched all his videos. No, it is a Hold On To Your Kids, sorry. Uh, I kept bumping into new information that made me question how firm this attach attachment is or the connection is with each one of my children. Um, Dr. Newfeld says that a child who's attached is going to try to please the parent. Hmm, I'm not sure my kids are trying to please me. <laughs> Certainly not all of them. Um, so I started to look deeper. And then I heard Dr. Neufeld go on and say, what makes parenting easy is not the love of the parent to the child. You can love your child to pieces, but what makes parenting easy is the love of the child to the parent. And I wonder to myself, am I seeing little hearts in, the, in my children's eyes? No, not always, not often. So what's going on? Is it possible that something about my parenting is making my children feel antagonism towards me? Is there something about my choices that's making them slam doors in my face? That's making them run to hide in their rooms, to roll their eyes at me, to avoid eye contact, to refrain from physical contact, and to generally avoid me in the house. So this is not easy um, to look these things in the eye and answer these questions. So it didn't sound to me like a firmly attached child, uh, what I was seeing at home. They didn't, it just didn't, something wasn't working. So it, it actually sounded like unhappy children, and I needed to dig deeper in order to figure out what's going on. So we entered the stage of the rebellious preteens, uh, and that's really hard. It's really hard. Um, I was warned it's coming, but when... Um, I had no idea it could be so tough. Okay, so now what? I just sit there and experience this hard spot for the next few years till it passes. Um, this is how it's going to be. So experiencing all this door slamming and eye rolling um, and avoidance of hugs, um, I, I, I just couldn't accept it. I knew that a change was necessary and it felt really, really horrible to be in that place with my child. So I started setting limits. I started having monologues on how do we behave in this house. Um, in my view, I was a super parent, you know, standing her ground for the sake of the family. No one will behave like this in this house. I need to control this. I need to bring him back to calm seas. I'm not going to allow this sort of disrespectful behavior, but the struggle was real. And the tougher I got, the more the behavior persisted. So this is one miserable child that's standing in front of me and I'm a miserable mama in front of him. And it's just a terrible cycle that we were stuck in. Okay, so I'm learning and I'm reading this happened seven, eight, nine years ago. I'm trying to figure out how to design a parenting journey that's going to bring us closer together. So I keep scribbling in my notebook um, and thinking, how do I create a better connection? with my kids. How do I bring us closer together? So I'm going to share with you a few of the journeys that I created. I can't share them all. This is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to take too many hours, but I'll share a little bit. And um, I'm going to share how I implemented the journeys and what the results were and how you could design your own reattachment and bonding journey with your own kids. Okay. So the parenting journeys that I did and I'm going to discuss with you today are three. Um, and I'm going to teach you how to design them too. So uh, the first journey I'm going to share with you is the nonviolent communication journey that I did, 100 days of nonviolent communication. The second journey was 100 family meetings journey. And the third journey was 100 days of digital detox for mom. Okay. Are you ready to get started? <laughs> so uh, let's start with the nonviolent communication journey. So I knew I needed to change something in the communication between us something about the way I was communicating was um, closing my children up and they were not um, open to attachment with me, to communicate with me. The energy wasn't good in the house. So I bumped into the concept of nonviolent communication about nine years ago and I started reading 
and watching videos of uh, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, uh, the founder of Nonviolent Communication. And his approach to communication between humans uh, helped me better understand how to communicate on a daily basis with my kids and how, because of my ignorance on how to speak respectfully with children, I was causing more harm than good to my relationship with them. So the first concert I learned uh, was to start communicating by my, my needs, my human needs, rather than using manipulative or coercive language that aims to induce fear in the child or guilt or shame. So I learned to take guilt and shame and fear um, and threatening and um, yelling out of the equation. So I sat down and I designed a 100-day journey uh, and in every, as in every single journey that I'm going to discuss here, I took an accountability car partner, my dear, dear, dear friend from New York. Um, you know who you are if you're watching. And we helped each other keep us in check. So me and my partner uh, chose to listen to Marshall Rosenberg's videos, lectures on YouTube. And we pulled out highlights. And then we text them to each other for discussion. And then we practice during our day. And we count down the journey day by day. So here's an example of a text that I sent to my partner. I wrote like this. Um, Marshall Rosenberg says to focus on our feelings and needs when approaching our children. I'm texting this. He says that if you imply wrongness or even just think that your child is wrong, it automatically decreases the chances of us getting what we want. Um, he says to focus on the feelings, like saying, when you do this, I feel angry. Or when you're not ready to leave at the agreed time, I feel anxious and impatient. So in short, we should describe what we feel. My beautiful partner texts me back. He writes, I can do that. And so begins our daily practice of this new concept. And day after day, we are watching Rosenberg's videos uh, in parallel, and we're practicing speaking our needs to the kids without yelling, without losing ourselves in an adult tantrum. And I'm reminding myself to be careful not to use feelings in a manipulative manner with my kids. For example, um, Marshall Rosenberg said, if you say something like, it really hurts me when you don't clean up your room, or... Uh, you make me angry when you say that. Those are considered violent expressions. They're not describing what I feel. They are blaming. And that's how you lose connection with your child. So day by day, we hold each other accountable to speaking respectfully and expressing our needs in a non-judgmental manner. For our children. Some days are awesome. And we find that we get more cooperation from the kids because, hey, a child that feels respected is a child that wants to connect and please his adult. On other day, all hell breaks loose. It's a journey. It's a long journey, but the payoffs are enormous. And the relationship with the kids, with each child individually, um, and with all of them as a group begins to relax and blossom. And I begin to uh, pick the fruits of my labor. I, I begin to watch them grow. Okay, so that's the nonviolent communication journey. Uh, just to quickly summarize, if you choose to do the journey, um, choose the little change that you'd like to make. Decide on the length of the journey. Could be three days, could be seven days, could be 100 days. Um, choose an accountability partner and announce to them about what this journey is about and how long they need to hold you accountable. It needs to be someone that really cares about you and will hold you accountable and embark and count days. You can text days to your partner. You can hang a chart on the fridge and mark off days. Um, whatever way uh, you can do it is um, whatever works. Okay, let's move on to journey number two um, that I did for parenting. It's called the family meetings journey. So. Um, a few years ago, when I was starting these journeys, I was observing um, my family and trying to see how do we strengthen the relationships and the attachment. And then I bumped into the concept of family. So 
we are up. Let me, I'm sorry, let me turn this up for a sec. Okay, I hope it's still hearing. So we're all very busy. We are running around between all our overscheduled activities. Um, there's really time when all of us sit together, all seven of us, uh, to work out things, uh, work out kinks, work out problems. Is so I needed to create this change for us. So um, if you've ever worked in the corporate world, you know that most companies run company weekly meetings where all the employees touch regarding how their projects are going, uh, what goals they've achieved in the week that passed, what goals they aim to achieve the next week. So coming together um, as a corporate team to connect and get on the same page and troubleshoot problems in a company is something very common. Uh, the same with families. How are families supposed to function together as a cohesive unit made up of individual members if we're in a state of disconnect? Okay, and we haven't stopped this train to sit down and update all the members about our goals, our problems, our needs, our thoughts, and our feelings. Okay, so I'll tell you how. Uh, because of the extreme busyness of modern day society, most families are winging it. You know, chat a bit before school, chat some more on the drive, maybe a couple of minutes before bedtime. Uh, and these are wonderful moments of important moments of connection, but they don't incorporate everyone and a lot of information gets lost in the craziness of life. So if we were to find 30 minutes weekly to all get on the same page, this ship is going to uh, sail much smoother in the following week. You really have to try it to find out what a difference it makes. So this is how I embark on the family meetings journey. This was eight years ago. So once a week, every week, we sit down to troubleshoot and discuss and review the last week and plan the upcoming week. So the way this journey was designed was I count day one for the first meeting, and day two for the next meeting, and on and on until I reach 100 meetings. So we've been doing this journey for seven or eight years, so I no longer count. Uh, we have long surpassed the 100 meetings line, um, and not a week goes by that we do not convene as a family. It's become just an inseparable part of our family culture, uh, and it can become a part of your family culture as well. So the third and final journey that I'm going to discuss today is the digital detox journey for mom. Okay. And that's how we're going to end this broadcast. So um, would you like to hear about the digital detox journey for moms? So when I first started this journey, I think I did this one five years ago. Um, I realized that I was spending a lot of time on digital devices and that was blocking me from being a good mom. Uh, honestly, there are so many interesting things going on in my phone and online. I think you will identify that I could easily just sit there all day and click away, not needing any other stimulation. I'm exaggerating, but sadly, there's more than a grain of truth to this, isn't there? So I've realized back then that I become a mom that's often distracted. Uh, not fully present, semi-addicted to surfing on a device and having my kids be on hold until after I finish getting updated with all this anxiety-producing news and gossip on Facebook and other social media um, outlets. So our kids were on hold until we finished clicking. Isn't that the truth these days? Think about it. Oof. Um, so, um, is this how I pictured, uh, my mothering to be when I dreamt of doing things right? Is this how you pictured your mothering to be? I think the answer is no. So I made a decision to say goodbye to Facebook for 100 days. That was my journey. That was my personal choice. So I posted on my Facebook feed the following words. 
Word for word, hello friends, I'm taking a Facebook break in order to reconnect with those important to me during the summer break. I will see you all in September. My phone number is blah, 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 and you may reach me there. And I'm out, just like that. <laughs> On the first day, I keep wanting to check my feed to see who liked my post after leaving. You know, the usual craving for connection in all the wrong places. <laughs> Instead, I try to keep myself busy. And I shared uh, with my digital detox accountability partner uh, from New Jersey, another amazing, amazing mama friend. I shared with her that I've embarked and I'm having a tough a tough time because my brain keeps wanting to check my phone. So I offer to read aloud to the kids. That should pass the time and reconnect me to the present moment. And after reading, I want to check my phone again. And instead I go and I do the dishes and I decide to cook something special for dinner. Lasagna. <laughs> Anything to keep busy and not think about my phone. So I'm starting to realize this was five years ago. Um, just how addictive these devices are and how much they take away from our parenting. What a price the children pay for us having these devices um, unmonitored and not in check. So from task to task, from home chore to home chore, I navigated through those first few days. Um, Sometimes I would look at the clock and think to myself, it's only 9 a.m. How am I going to last an entire day without social media? <laughs> um, these, this is really intimate, but this is really how it was. Um, interestingly, all of a sudden, I finally had time. Um, I had time to practice guitar, which I never had before. I had time to read. I had time to write my book. I had time to sit and listen to the children tell me their stories. So was all this time always there, but was completely consumed by brainless surfing on social media? So the way I designed this journey, I created no-fly zones. That was the next step. So there were two no-fly zones per day because I realized I can't disconnect completely from from my phone, I need my phone um, to do logistics, to set up things, to communicate with my uh, friends and with my husband. So I set up two no-fly zones. One no-fly zone was from 8 to 12 p.m. while I homeschooled the kids, and another no-fly zone was from 3 to 8 p.m. while I spend the afternoon with them. And in between, I can access my phone. So I shared my no-fly zones with my amazing accountability partner. Um, and she shared her no-fly zones with me as well. So that way we could hold each other accountable to not being on the phone during those hours. And we embarked. And we started counting days and sharing it on a WhatsApp chat. So day one, with full presence, I text her. Day two, with full presence, I text her. Not during no-fly zones, yes? <laughs> Only when I'm allowed. And so on, until I reached 100 days uh, without Facebook and 100 days of no-fly zones completed. Um, summer break was over, and in September, I returned to social media, but much, 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 much more mindful about how it takes over my life and makes me um, an absent parent, although present in body. So I learned the hard way that digital devices need to be managed very very, 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 very carefully by us moms and super mindfully. So let me tell you what happens to your relationship with your kids when you embark on a similar journey of saying goodbye to your phone for part of the day. You have time to play with them. You have time to read to them. You have time to cook with them. You have time to just sit and hang out with them. Whoever has time to do that, you have time to take them places, uh, to look them in the eye, to connect. They reciprocate your presence and shower you back 
with so much goodness amplified. Try it. Yeah, try it. Don't take my word for it. So our children, they just want us to shine our rays on them. We are like their sun. And they are the planets circling us. The sun cannot shine when she is on her phone. No, she can't. And you know what happens to flowers who do not receive sunshine and nourishment, right? So let's separate from our devices for a certain time window and a day and be in full presence and shine our rays on these beautiful, beautiful flowers of ours. This isn't work. This is our great work. Our relationship with our kids is our work of art. When all is said and done and you look back on your life, um, investing in learning how to communicate nonviolently, uh, investing in family meetings, investing in putting away your digital devices is something that I doubt you're going to regret. It may even be the biggest pride of your life. So there are many other parenting journeys that I've done and I am going to share it with you slowly. Uh, I'm currently working on a secret project that's going to be revealed soon. So if you want to be waitlisted, on it and be the first to find out about it. I'm going to share the link in the first comment of the video. And I want to leave you with this thought. Parenting is messy. Parenting is hard. Parenting is nothing like the movies that they show in Hollywood. Because it is a million times more powerful and more magical. So stay tuned for the rest of the journeys. I'm going to be sharing on the Journeys for Moms page uh, the rest of this week uh, and go back and watch the other two journeys from the last two days because the learning never stops at Journeys for Moms. I would love to hear from you in the comments, your thoughts, your feelings, your impressions, your observations. Care to share over and out and have the best day mama <laughs>